Hi, everybody. Welcome back. I'm thrilled to have you join us again for our next episode of Minding the Mind. I am Dr. Derek Lindquist. I am the Dean of the Jindal School of Psychology and Counseling at OP Jindal Global University. And again, I'm happy to have you. So we're now on the second of two parts. In our last episode, we were talking about action potentials. And we kind of laid out how the inside of a neuron is electrically negative relative to the outside and how this is maintained in a large part by these concentration gradients with respect to different ions, sodium, potassium, and chloride. So today, I really want to talk to you about action potentials. Now, as we've talked about multiple times, action potentials are how neurons communicate with one neuron to another. Okay? Action potentials travel down an axon, and at the end of that axon, we have terminals and that allows for this electrical signal, the action potential, then to be converted into a chemical signal, i.e. the release of neurotransmitter. Okay? So what we need to understand then is how an action potential is generated. Well, the most important part for the initiation of an action potential is the area of the cell body where it tapers down into the axon itself. We call this the axon hillock. And it is the membrane potential at the axon helix that determines whether an action potential is generated at any single moment in time. Okay? Now, again, potential essentially just means voltage or this charge differential. Again, it's the idea that the inside of the neuron is electrically negative relative to the outside. So, if we have a hypothetical neuron and its interior is negative 60 millivolts, well, if we make the interior less negative, i.e. more positive, the term for this is depolarization, right? The inside now is depolarizing. So you're going from negative 60 to negative 50, negative 40, et cetera. Alternatively, if we make the inside more negative, going from negative 60 to negative 70, then negative 80, the term for that is hyperpolarization. Okay, depolarization, less negative, hyperpolarization, more negative. So, again, let's think of our hypothetical neuron. We're at the axon hillock, and we're recording the membrane potential. It's sitting at negative 70. If that membrane potential depolarizes a little bit, that is, it becomes less negative, it will ultimately reach what we call threshold. Threshold automatically generates an action potential. So in this example, and I know these numbers vary a little bit, but it's the concept here that's important. So we're going from negative 90, which is our resting membrane potential, and if we depolarize up to negative 65, that is threshold. Once we reach negative 65, again, that leads to this automatic production of an action potential. Now, an action potential is what we call an all or none event. It's like shooting a gun. You can't kind of shoot a gun. You do or you don't. It's binary. The same is true for an action potential. It's either going to happen or does happen or it does not. There's nothing in the middle, no middle ground. And every time an action potential is generated, it occurs in the same fashion. It has the same amplitude and the same speed or conduction vol uh, velocity. That is, it travels down the axon in the same exact fashion every single time that action potential occurs. So what is responsible for the action potential? Well, you know, in one of our first episodes, I said it's just like a little electrical pulse that travels down the axon. And that's largely true. But again, what underlies that electrical pulse? Well, it's the flow of ions. Okay, so here we're going from our resting membrane potential of negative 70. We depolarize to negative 65, and we generate an action potential. And this is controlled through what we call voltage-gated sodium and voltage-gated potassium channels. Voltage-gated, meaning they have a little sensor that can detect the voltage of the membrane in which they're embedded. When that membrane potential reaches negative 65, i.e. threshold, what happens? The voltage-gated sodium channels very quickly open. Now, we've already established in our last episode that opening a sodium channel leads to the influx of sodium. And in this case, we have a lot of sodium flowing in through a lot of sodium channels. That leads to depolarization. So again, we're looking at the interior of the neuron. Right now we're at threshold at negative 65. 
and now we're going to go all the way up. We're going to get less and less negative to the point that the inside of the neuron for a very brief moment in time becomes electrically positive with respect to the outside. So in this case, the interior of the axon goes all the way up to plus 40. 40 millivolts more positive relative to the outside. Now this is occurring very, very rapidly within about a millisecond. Those sodium channels open and then a millisecond later they close. They clamp off and they allow more, no more sodium to flow in. But we're still at uh, plus 40. We need to hyperpolarize. This is due to the voltage-gated potassium channels that now open. We call these delayed rectifier channels because once threshold is reached, they delay for about a millisecond before they open. And again, as we discussed in our last episode, a potassium channel, when it opens, potassium flows out. Potassium is a positively charged ion, so all that positive charge goes with it. The result is you get more negative or less positive, if you will. So in this case, when these potassium channels open and potassium flows out, we go very quickly from plus 40 all the way back to negative 70, and in fact, just a little bit below that. So this rapid rise and then decrease in voltage, that is the action potential. And again, it's nothing more than a sodium channel open, sodium flowing in, and then closing, and then right at that point, potassium channel opens, potassium flows out, and then it closes. Okay, this is an action potential. It starts at the axon helix, and very quickly it travels all the way down the axon until it invades the terminals at the end. Now, I always try to make uh, these examples a little more um, sort of true to life, provide some examples to illustrate. So maybe some of you have heard of puffer fish, right? I've never had it. It's a delicacy in Japan. I'd love to try it someday. But every year, some number of people die from consuming puffer fish because it contains what we call a neurotoxin. This is called TTX, or tetrodotoxin, and it is a sodium channel antagonist. Now, a couple episodes ago, we talked about antagonists. They block a receptor. So in this case, over here on the left, this is our sodium channel. It opens and sodium flows in, exactly as it should occur. TTX, or tetrodotoxin, sits right in the middle of that channel. It blocks it. Sodium can't get in. And as we've just established, sodium is essential, critical, for the initiation of an action potential. If you have no sodium flowing in, you have no action potential. So why is TTX so deadly? because it blocks action potentials all through the body. Those nerves essentially shut down, including the nerves that are required to move your muscles, such as your diaphragm. So if you get TTX and your muscles stop working, you can asphyxiate and ultimately die, which again, some number of people do each year. So once the action potential is generated, again, it's constant in terms of its amplitude and speed down the axon. But there's a lot of variability between different types of neurons. So what determines that speed? Well, one is the diameter of the axon, right? Just like a garden hose versus a fire hose. The bigger the diameter, the faster the water flows through the hose. The same is true for an axon and an action potential. Bigger diameter axons lead to faster conduction velocity for the action potential, meaning the action potential travels more quickly. The other part here is Axons are leaky, right? There's sodium and, uh, sodium and potassium channels where these ions are just kind of leaking out all the time. Imagine a leaky water pipe. How would you fix it? Well, one way is you wrap it up in duct tape, right? You insulate it so that leak is no longer occurring. Well, Mother Nature has settled on a similar effect. So in this case, we have something called myelin. It's just this fatty substance that is wrapped around an axon. It provides that insulation to block those leakages. And myelin, interesting, is not a consistent sort of sheet. It's actually segmented. So you can see it here in the pink. This is a cross section. And this is an actual electron microscope image of an axon. So this black around the perimeter, that is the, the myelin being wrapped around the axon. Okay. So the benefit of the myelin is it dramatically increases the speed of the action potential. 
Right? You can see that in the little cartoon. This is a myelinated axon on top and an unmyelinated axon on the bottom. So over here in the figure, we're looking at the conduction velocity on the y-axis, the speed at which the action potential travels, versus the diameter of the axon. And if we look at that black line, it's not particularly steep. But if we look at the red line, which is our myelinated axons, as the fiber diameter goes up, that myelination leads to much, much faster conduction velocity. In other words, the action potential can travel down the axon at a much, much faster rate. Now, interestingly, as I said, the myelin is segmented. Each of those breaks or nodes is referred to as a node of Ron VA. And so we just talked about an action potential requiring the influx of sodium and the efflux of potassium. That occurs initially at the axon hillock, which generates the action potential. And as it travels down the axon, the only place where those ions flow in and out is at the nodes of Ron VA. Sodium flows in, potassium flows out. And again, you can actually see a genuine image over here on the right, taken with an electron microscope. So this leads to what we call saltatory conduction. The action potential is essentially able to skip or jump from one node to another, almost instantaneously. So you hit a node, sodium flows in, potassium flows out, and then it almost instantly jumps to the next node, and then the next node, and the next node. This is why action potential, the conduction velocity, is so much faster when an axon is myelinated relative to it when it is not. This process is ultimately called saltatory conduction, this jumping from one node to the next. And why is this critical? Because speed is king, right? What regulates it? One, the axon diameter, and two, whether it's myelinated or not. An unmyelinated small diameter axon can propagate a action potential at 10 or 11 miles per hour, a little faster than you walk. A myelinated big diameter axon can propagate an action potential up to 560 miles per hour. That's twice the speed as a professional race car, right? So again, everything that your brain controls, be that your movement or the processing of sensory information coming from the outside back up to your brain, the faster that information can flow, the better control that the organism ultimately has. This is true for us, and of course for bigger organisms such as whales and even elephants. And it's true for this guy, Wal Robert Wadlow. He is the tallest human being that we know of in recorded history. Eight feet, 11 inch, uh, eight feet 11 inches. Again, he just towers over everybody else. So he says feet move. He generates an action potential from his motor cortex, right? That travels down to his spinal cord and then ultimately all the way down into his legs. Now, if that took a second or two, every time he thought leg move, he obviously could not move around in the world. But because action potentials are so fast, that thought to move is almost instantly, or at least very, very quickly relayed to his legs, which allows for this smooth, coordinated movement that we see in him and virtually every other organism on Earth. So again, at the end of the day, the ability to process information, share information, it all comes down to the ability of these neurons to communicate through this electrochemical signaling. We've talked about action potentials today. When I see you again, we'll talk about the chemical side. We're going to come back and talk about neurotransmitters. So thank you all. I look forward to it. Bye-bye. Thank you.